Peace be with you and welcome back to Humankind Both Exploring the Mythical Path. Um, we're here with a few uh, guests talking about uh, racial injustices, how to combat them, what's been going around uh, with the uh, protests and the rallies and um, you know what what we should be focusing on. Uh, and uh, you know, if you don't mind, uh, you know, I'll I'll kind of get started. I mean, you know, I I truly believe that it starts at home. You know, all these uh, uh, teachings that um, we want to see our, our kids get exposed to. We should and and the future generation it should be starting with us at home. You know, if we have a toxic culture at home and expect um, you know the you know the world to be uh, kind of holding hands, it's it's not going to work that way. And kind of put the responsibility on the teachers or on the African American community solely, rather than us trying to make the change ourselves. And that that includes, to me, um, you know, having uh, people of diverse backgrounds get get into the police force. Right. That's one of the quickest ways to combat this is to increase the diversity that's there. Um, you know, as you know, as as well as uh, in your homes and uh, in your schools, because we see a huge disparity, right, of um, you know, one ethnicity o overpowering another ethnicity in terms of professionals. You know, is that because they don't have the opportunities or the education levels, or is is it is there something systemic behind that as well? That, that, that we might not know about, uh, you know, having access to uh, loans or scholarships or, uh, you know, things like that. There's a huge disparity in the education, uh, uh, you know, percentages with uh, ethnicities as well. So, you know, I, knowing, knowing that, you know, you have a certain platform, you, you want to use that plat, you know, that, use that platform kind of cash in your checks to, uh, you know, if you're of privilege or of education or of whatever, um, you want to be the first to lead by example. And that's why, you know, I, I've, you know I've been doing diversity trainings at, at um, police academies, and that's why I'm, I'm a chaplain for the police department, um, kind of there to be in there um, and to kind of uproot it from, from its source, right? Because uh, I guess to start is with your families and where you see it. Um, I saw it in the education, uh, and I saw that only one perspective was being pushed over another. Um, and so, you know, I tried to voice that and get that changed, and that's I think that's where it starts from. But Ari um, was mentioning about, you know, mental health and um, other things that are associated to this. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear more about that. I think definitely having diversity at every level is so important you know representation really does matter everyone wants to learn from someone that they can trust or someone that you know looks like them um but even if we were to increase the diversity to the percentage of african americans in the united states it would still be largely you know white uh in our schools in our you know police force it will still be predominantly white and so the diversity trainings are important of course um I, I feel that there, there's more. I, I think maybe we should expect diversity to even be more than the, the ratios that we have of the population because the population is learning from us and you don't learn from just one teacher. You learn from a lot of teachers. And so really increasing the amount of leaders, um, you know, in all of these spaces that are of uh, diverse backgrounds or perspectives is really vital. Uh, and I, I'm so glad that they're making changes. I, I know, you know, we learned about this social contract that's been, you know, um, it's void now because of the injustice that's been happening for a long time. But I know Trevor Noah has been talking a lot about the social contract that's been broken. And so how do we fix it? Or how do we come up with a new contract that everybody can be, you know, on boards with? Um, and it, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of sectors, you know, like we were mentioning, um, you know, police right now is involved in, you know, calls because of mental health issues or calls because of domestic violence issues. Um, in those cases, a lot of times, you know, diversity is not present. Um, and and a lot of um, a lot of police officers are just not 
you know, educated enough about mental health issues or about domestic violence issues or women's issues um, or family issues. Um, and, you know, just like the Arabic saying, you know, ask someone who's been there, don't ask, you know, the expert. The expert might not have been there, um, but the person who's been there knows exactly what it's like um, and, and can thus be a better educator about it. And so um, really changing the way that we hire, changing the way that we train, um, changing the way we think about what, what education is really is at the forefront of this. Um, it's, it's no longer just theoretical or academic. Um, it has to be very experiential. It has to, uh, it has to be hands on. It has to be through exposure. Um, and so I see a lot of opportunity here. It, it's just going to take a lot of us uh, to do that work. Um, and, and I'm trying to stay hopeful. I know that's not an easy thing. Um, and, and a lot of times you have to kind of pick yourself back up. Um, you know, you have to limit, like I said, your, your watching of media, um, you know, to 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it is that you think, the, the, you know, you can consume without getting deeply affected or weighed down. Um, you know, I think the, the important thing now is that we all try to find ways to stay hopeful in the midst of all this and to focus on the positives and to focus on the opportunities and ideas that we have and share them. Um, I think everyone uh, has creative ideas to contribute uh, to this transformative time. And, um, you know, what an honor to be witnessing this transformative time in history where we're really rethinking everything and coming up with a new social contract that hopefully will work for all of us. Yeah, I spoke to my African-American friend a couple of days ago and um, <clears throat> he said, you know, John, I think this is the one. And uh, it's something about George Floyd's situation that just seems different than all the other uh, racial injustice. And for me, I experienced it when I uh, drove, you know, in, in my hometown Avon here, where, you know, the majority is white. It seems like it's almost 100 percent white. I don't see any uh, minorities here, but I actually, you know, they had a protest rally here in Avon and and 100 percent of them were white and all of them were holding up signs like black lives matter you know no justice no peace and i'm like wow you know usually you you would see the, the the protesting happening in more diverse uh you know urban areas but this is just 100 percent white and they were all protesting and they they seem it's it's like you know i think they're hearing they're finally hearing um, the cries and the pains and they're seeing all the stories add up of police officers, you know, just killing innocent black people. And I don't, I, you know, I, I think the, the, the title police officer has more to do with it than race. So diverse, unfortunately, we see a lot of black cops, um, you know, mistreating their own kind. Um, so, you know, diversifying the police force, I think, it could mediate some factors, but it wouldn't really change the issue here, the, 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 the problem with cops. Chris Rock said um, there are certain jobs that you can't have bad apples, right? Like pilots, for an example. You can't have bad apples. That's a really bad thing if you have bad pilots, right? They have too much power in their hand. They can, they can kill a lot of people. Police officers, same thing. You can't have bad apple police officers uh, you just can't afford it they have too much power in their hand um so i think in terms of what do we do to start to change i think you have to become educated uh, i in my study with conceptual metaphor theory we 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 study how metaphors actually affect the way we think and black okay has always been associated with negativity even in the bible um, Satan is addressed as the prince of darkness, right? And Jesus is the light of the world. Light and white, bright things are good. Dark is always black and evil. And, and, and you know, it probably goes back to the evolutionary times when, you know, we associate, obviously, the dark time is when animals would come out and will be more susceptible to being killed. And daytime is good because we can see and we can protect ourselves. So much so that they've done studies where um, you're hooked up to fMRIs and they can see our brain patterns and they would show every race, black, uh, white, Hispanics, pictures of white men 
and pictures of black men. And almost all of the participants who are not, who claim to not be racist, the amygdala activated every time and then saw the black person, including the black person himself. His brain would activate the amygdala part, the part associated with fear, would show minor stimulation when seeing the black person versus the white person. So it really goes deeper than I think, uh, um, you know, cultural upbringing, um, you know, but once we become educated of that, and, and I think once we bring any issue to awareness, that's when we can start changing things, right? That's when we can start rewiring our brains and, and what we're used to. Um, you know, so I think, I, th I honestly think George Floyd's death is is a big one. People are starting to hear. Now we just have to really get down to the root of things. And um, unfortunately, I, I, I agree with Zahir, it starts with the home. Um, yeah, statistics show that if you don't grow up with a father, you're you're twenty percent likely to be to, to to commit a criminal act. And um, I think it's a very large percentage of being incarcerated in general. Uh, it, it's crazy. I mean, you absolutely need a father figure, and unfortunately, in the black community, uh, you just don't have a lot of you know um, uh, two couples together in the picture. Um, and so that's a problem, and that's something the black community has to certainly work out on their own. And, um, you know, and it's especially the way you respond to cops as well. Um, you know, there's two ways. If cop stops you, uh, you, know the, you know the system is rigged against you. You know you're going to get pulled over because you're black, similarly to a Muslim being pulled aside in the airport. It's going to happen. That's, that's the, the system is rigged against you. But now that you know you're dealt these cards, do you complain about the cards and just constantly whine? No, no, it's not fair. It's not weird. Or do you use the cards you have and try to play them to the best of your ability? And that's what I was saying with ignoring or not giving it too much attention. The, we know the system is rigged against you. We know it. We understand it. Now what? You have to fight through it in the meantime. There's been um, a few generations that have tried to take that approach of knowing what do you say to your kids? H how do you uh, handle it differently? They've gone to their faith to, to sustain them in this approach. We, we need to get beyond that now because literally we are seeing folks in their own neighborhoods being hunted down and but uh, as preyed upon. We are having people that have become successful and living in neighborhoods that they wouldn't be in before, um, jogging in their own neighborhood and, and being challenged because of their color. And they've done all the right things. They And they be, responded uh, obsequiously to the officers. There is something deeply rooted in the system that has to be taken out and you can't just take that out with um, a, a passive yes master kind of response to a predator or to someone who totally believes that you aren't human for whatever reasons they have. Was it the poverty law in, um, in Alabama? You know, for years we're teaching tolerance. And in 2003, when I visited there, we were in a minivan, a bunch of us of various um, ethnicities. And the bus pulled up to trying to figure out where this building was located, Southern Poverty Law Center. And we were in front of this building that had cement kind of barricading going up almost a whole story high. It, it was an odd looking building and a police officer came to our van and can I help you? And we said, yeah, we're looking for this building. Where, where can you help us find it? And he goes and points to Southern Poverty Law Center that had recently bar created the cement barricade because they get because they are fighting white supremacy, get bomb threats several times a day. And they get potential of uh, people were, were planning to, as they are doing now in protests, taking these large vehicles and just ramming the building and constantly being under violent threat. 
and constantly feeling this intensity. And people of color have said in social media and in, in person, um, you know, you folks are experiencing COVID and feeling, you know, oppressed and feeling a lack of being able to live your lives fully. This is how we've felt every day of our life. Um, once you are no longer two or three and having a friend that might be a different color than you, at some point, that person is not, not able to be your friend for some reason. And it's, it's bigger than education. It's bigger than um, responding correctly because two generations now since the Civil Rights Act was changed have tried to do that um, and it hasn't worked. Why is George just death different? Not too many people have actually witnessed for eight minutes a murder. It's resonating because now there is some realization that this is in fact what some friends of yours may have mentioned before or what people are expressing as what has oppressed them. There was no reason for this man to die, yet a young woman, black woman of privilege has had over 84 million views because she decided to say, I do not want to um, hold up a person who is uh, imperfect, who was looting or was passing a bad check as a martyr. All of our lives are imperfect. No one deserves to die, to die that way just because of color. And no one deserves to die in such a symbolic fashion that is at the root of this whole tyranny, stepping on someone's neck. It was said that this is what they are attempting to do. And we physically saw it now, eight minutes of it. We saw it. And I think that is what is enabling some of this change, opening up conversation. But a passive, Jonathan, I can't agree with what you've said because I've seen too many people um, and heard too many stories that basically say that doesn't work. It, it really depends on your experiences. You know, there are African Americans out there that would say, look, I've never had problems with law enforcement. Yes, I've been pulled over constantly for no reason. And of course, they use the excuse of you have a busted headlight. That's their way of, you know, giving, uh, allowing them to pull you over with no cause, right? Um, so, but they say that, you know, all I would do is, is stay silent. License registration, I know I'm being pulled over for no reason. It's because of my skin color. So going back to what I said, we know the, the the, the game is rigged against you, right? Um, but how do you respond? And then you want to look at two figures, uh, Malcolm X, who obviously was, I would say, a, a more offensive type of um, person. And, and you know, certainly he's a, a, a huge historical figure in the African-American community. But then you have Martin Luther King, who I, I don't want to say he's passive, but his approach was love, essentially, and it was almost kill him with kindness in a way, but he would, he made the biggest change, if, if you want to take it to there. I mean, he made by, he changed the world forever. And if you, you can't tell me that these looters and protesters, although I, I support the protesters, that they're that offensive um, um, attack mode is somehow going to be more significant than Martin Luther King's kumbaya love approach. Um, you know, it's certainly, I, I think, going back to religion, love is the answer to everything. And how you respond to uh, injustice, um, how you respond to evil, to negativity, um, it could never be said that it, war is the solution to war, right? It can never be said that hatred is the solution to hatred. It's love that pierces everything. And when you love and show, display humility and kindness to the officer that pulls you over for no reason, that love can pierce his heart. That love can get you free. Now, when you start complaining and pulling out your phone and, and why are you pulling me over knowing it's injustice but now challenging him being on the offensive mode we've seen many times how what that results to 
and it's nothing good. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I think we need to be conscious of our actions and 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 realize that maybe Martin Luther King's route is probably the way we should go. Um, you know, there's a reason why Islam, you go to the mosque, it, it, you, you see blacks, you see whites, you see all kinds. They don't talk about race. It's not even a thing there. When you step into the mosque, you are, God, it doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter your, it, you're, you're God's child. You're there to pray to God. Everything else is irrelevant. Um, that's one thing I love about Islam and Christians have not figured this out yet. There's a reason why there's black churches and white churches. When you go to the white churches, there's not a single black person in there. They haven't figured it out. Um, they, 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 they make race into such a big thing where Islam, it's, it just completely erases it. Um, it's, it's, so I'm not saying let's just turn the cheek, you know, Martin Luther King didn't turn the cheek, um, you know, but his approach was love. The way he responded was love. It wasn't the offensive. And all I'm saying is I think we should, the approach should be love. Love first, and then everything else will figure itself out. I, I haven't. I was full of love the day I killed six police officers in that training that I spoke of in our last session. Anything can trigger uh, a, a, a hidden emotional response or an, an awareness that you don't even know you have. Um, so being an ally is, in, in fact, one of the, the steps to take to be, be positive. I believe I'm going to wrap this conversation now anyway and leave it on how, what is an ally and how do we be an ally? I urge to jump in here just, you know, as I'm practicing being an ally and really, you know, following my gut on this. I putting the blame or putting the responsibility on, you know, African-American fathers. And I, I feel like that's not, I feel like that's not right. I feel like that's, that's all part of the systemic problem that led to that in the first place. The um, poverty. Yeah. yeah. Like they're in poverty because their families are in poverty. It's a cycle, you know, of poverty that is not easily broken. And then it's our, it's, it's not, I want to say our fault, but it's, it's part of the injustice that was committed. It's the, it's, you know, we should argue against, um, for, against the perpetration that happened to lead to those, you know, occurrences to begin with. Um, there was an economic disadvantage for years that led to this. I'm not going to say, oh, well, African-American fathers are just not responsible and they're all going to jail. Well, if they, you know, if they had an equal chance, they wouldn't be in jail to begin with. Or if they had the upbringing that the average white American family has, they wouldn't be, uh, you know, put into this predicament. Um, I mean, to put the blame or to shift the blame back onto these African American men, I feel like is part of the problem and why everybody just feels like, oh, well, you have an education, you have access, um, you have freedom, you know, just get over and do it yourself. It's not that easy. It's not even possible without allies and without a change system. And on that note, we will gather again to have conversations because conversations is part of the solution. Thank you for joining us today.